Welcome to LinkedIn Heroes. Today we have a very exciting guest joining us. Chris is the Global Startup Director for Startup Grind, powered by Google for Entrepreneurs, inspiring, educating, and in connecting 1 million plus entrepreneurs in 300 cities in 120 countries around the world. His local partners include ASX, Deloitte Private, Salesforce, IBM, Myob, Zendesk, and NAB. Uh, Chris, welcome to LinkedIn Heroes. Thanks, man. How are you feeling today? Feel good. Wet. Wet. Just been raining outside, which is unique for Melbourne, isn't it? No, yeah, it's a bit, diff <laughs> bit different. No, no, I'm feeling good, man, yeah. Yeah, so do you tell us a little bit about how you first got involved with Startup Grind and that story, how it all began? Yeah, so uh, going on like six, six, seven years ago now, it was Dave McClure was one of the big names we had, had on stage at the time, and, um, and two guys in banana suits. This is a true story. Jumped into the audience and they just wanted to, and it had, um, just wanted to grab his attention so they could pitch him. Anyway, the story ran with TechCrunch and that's how I heard about Startup Grind. I had a, an event series I was already running, about 450 people called Melbourne Internet Business Group. Reached out, they weren't in Australia at the time and just knew that, um, and just kind of went through the interview process, pleaded with them, you know, let me have it in Australia, let me bring it out here. And I think Sydney and Melbourne launched at the same time. And my thinking was if we were just had some sort of tie to Silicon Valley, we were gonna, you know, win this win this startup event thing. And that was before Google for Entrepreneurs we we had to deal with the global deal with Google for Entrepreneurs, so yeah. I just I, I bet right, yeah. And Yeah, you did. You did <laughs> mate. Like I I just I love going to these events because it's always always fascinating people that you're interviewing, and they're always like you know sort of the international market, um, such inspiring stories. And it must not have been that, that from, right from the start, was it? So well, it was. Was it? No. <laughs> it's, I think, you know we've got progressively you know bigger and better. I think. Um, what, what was one of the key defining moments where you thought, okay, um, this is going to make a big impact? Yes. Zendesk, okay. Yeah, so we had the founder of Zendesk come out. It was pretty early on, four or five months uh, in, and um, I think it's the PR, one of the PR groups had, had, had been to our event or had heard about us and then just said, look, would you like to ho host M Mikkel on stage? And we're like, you yeah, know, of course we would. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the first time we really filled it out and kind of made, made a name for ourselves. And I think we were, at, you know, we were at YBF at the time. And then after that, it was a bit easier to get, you know, the next headline because you go, oh, we've hosted the founder of Zendesk, we've hosted, you know, the CEO of Zero, and just kind of kept um, piggybacking off the yeah. yeah the previous speakers. And, and along the the way with your startup grind or your journey as an entrepreneur, you must have encountered challenges. We all encounter a lot of them as entrepreneurs that we've had to overcome. Um, what's one of the ones that perhaps stands out that you'd like to share with us today? Um, probably not anything to do with startup grind. I think it came from my uh, private label business, and that was. Um, Private label. For yeah. What, what so we would we would sell um, custom products, which is private. Another way of saying private label, but for big uh, retailers like right. Woolworths and Coles and Coca Cola, BP, wherever they are, um, they're they're a client. Um, and yeah, so that's where the big headaches were, and that was um, um, sometimes being too successful. Yeah, uh, there was definitely times when we completely stuffed it up, <laughs> but the, you know it was odd to me that sometimes uh, being too successful was about to kill us. So we had we had ninety day terms with Woolworths. Mm. So you you know you so you'd, you'd pay two hundred grand to get all these containers of product on the water, and you know so all your money kind of went out, and you weren't going to get paid for ninety days. Meanwhile, they ordered again and again, mm. and you think, oh, this is a great problem but you're like well we don't have the money to fucking pay for this yes. uh, excuse me you know we're going to beat this stuff or what oh we're okay with swearing it <laughs> okay, good, on good. This show. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Uh, and then um you know and um you know luckily managed to get you know loans with the banks in time not not the easiest things mm. to do and um kept on chugging along but yeah that was the time where we were about to go under because we were doing too good yeah, and all the guys, I mean, the times that I've seen you interview uh, successful entrepreneurs, they've all got similar stories, haven't they, where they've had to pull things together and do a bit of a juggling act. Absolutely. I think one of the best <laughs> ones was Kogan, you know. We, yeah. had, we had the event here with Kogan. And yeah, I, I, I remember buying tickets for that. I think I had to be out of the, the uh, city, though. I didn't miss it. Uh, he basically you know, said that he funded his whole company uh, with credit card fraud, and it was pretty, <laughs> pretty funny, and he, he just 
just was like signing up. You know, he had all these orders from eBay, but they froze his account. He was, or, you know, had these, had the, the all the television sets from China coming in. But they, so all these people made these orders, a pre-order, but uh, they hadn't received the goods, so therefore, therefore they couldn't, you know, give him the rating. So um, eBay just froze his accounts, right? And he, and said like, you got to come up with the money. Like the people haven't got their TVs yet. He's like, well, I need the money to go buy the TV. So just um, started uh, signing up for every credit card he could. You know, remember like 10 years ago, you could just like do an online form and then um, then created a bot, you know, like a robot that basically go and fill in forms around the internet until he had about 50K in credit cards, uh, in credit, and then uh, still wasn't quite enough to then recruit all these mates to do the same thing. And that's how we got uh, the first orders done. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Wow, I had no idea. I know that you've got a lot going on at the moment. What is it that you're excited about, whether it's in startup grind or in the business world at the moment? Yeah, so at the moment, uh, you know, I'm working with this company called uh, Wall Circuit. That's, that's one of the things I'm, I'm passionate about uh, now. Uh, so fintech or something? It's a fintech. It's equity crowdfunding and. Um, what I love about equity crowdfunding, I don't think anyone's quite nailed it yet either, um, is the ability to kind of democratise venture capital because it used to be controlled, you know, by the investors and and it's just a pretty shitty process for for the startup, right? You got to go around and and talk to these investors and get knocked back and you know change your pitch deck 50 times, um, where you know in theory, right? This this you put your 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 proposition up and all the investors come to you, and not only that, you, it's not just sophisticated investors now; it's retail investors. So. Uh, anyone could put, you know, 500 bucks into a company, which is very cool because, um, you know, when you get a company like Vino Mofo or something that's very heavily driven by your community and people that love your brand, empowering those people to invest in your company is pretty, pretty powerful stuff. We're at the cutting edge of the startup community in Australia. What is your thoughts around where the industry is heading? Because we're a bit behind the rest of the world, aren't we? Like, I mean, most people are getting funding from the US and Singapore. And... Yeah, um, I think... Um, I think we're changing, but we still have this, like I call it, um, the Kylie Minogue syndrome, is what I call it. What's the Kylie Minogue? Well, I, 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 you know, you can call it the Chris Hemsworth syndrome or whatever you want, but it's like you've got to go outside of Australia, become big, and then you come back to Australia and everyone wants to, you know, be your yeah, be your best mate. <laughs> I think that's kind of a ridiculous thing to happen. People have got to kind of recognize that, uh, or even, even Ruby Rose, right? Nobody would give her a role, she said, in Australia. She had to go to Hollywood. It's just kind of bullshit, really. So I think people have just got to recognize and just you know trust their instincts here and go that, that sounds like a great fucking idea yeah. um, let's back it rather than just pass on it they go and make it somewhere else if one thing I would say to Australian startups is think Asia yeah. because it's always you know and we're powered by Google love you guys a lot of Australians still have this kind of um, thinking where we're going to go to venture, you know, we're going to go to Silicon Valley and that's what we're going to do. And, that, and for the most, sometimes that really works, but for the most time that's like, holy shit, now we're going to pay 450 grand for a developer or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, we're, we're one of a million people chasing the, you know, the deal with Google or, you know, Facebook. And I get there's a lot of serendipity that happens there. Like, you, you just be sitting down at lunch and this one's from Groupon and this one's from, you know, wherever else, Sana. But Asia's so close. They, wouldn't, they don't see the deal flow, they're looking at Australia, Australia, see what we can do, and the products are oftentimes translatable if we can, you know, yeah. figure it out, and a much bigger market. Yeah, and that, I don't know, so they just make quicker decisions, I just think Hong Kong, yeah. everyone makes quicker decisions over there, it's a fun place to do business. We've got that yeah. dude from started Facebook, um, was it Eduardo over there in Singapore, I met him once, but he, yeah. he arrived and bought like my team. Ferraris and Lamborghinis in one week just to you know, just to keep it quiet. Just to say hi, I've arrived. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. It's Eduardo. Eduardo plates. Eduardo one, two, three, and four. And it's tradition at LinkedIn Heroes to mm. ask this question. Mm -hmm. The question is, if you could be a superhero, who would you choose and why? I'm going to rip off Quentin Tarantino here. I love this the Reservoir Dogs bit where he says Superman, Superman, because Superman. Um, is the only one that is just always a superhero that tries to try and hide and be normal where every other superhero, Batman or whatever, they're normal and they have to get into the suit to become the superhero. When, when is it you're playing normal then? You're playing normal now? I am right now. I'm going global conference uh, coming to Melbourne for APAC. Really? Yeah, in December. Got some heavy hitters announced already and we're just going to blow everyone out of the water. I just put that right there Ooh. now. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Finished. Awesome. Yeah. See you next week. Thank you. He doesn't get into a disguise, he's super but has to try and hide. Yes.
being super. All the rest, they're normal people when they get into this outfit and then turn super. 